Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first ever virtual State of the Arts. Thank you for, for joining us. My name is Miguel Perez. I'm an arts reporter for KERA. Our conversation today, which is uh, brought to you by Art and & Seek and the Dallas Museum of Art, was fueled by a series of radio profiles you may have heard on KERA, where they've been airing for the past couple of months now. The idea for a series on Black creativity started with my conversation with Jamie Holmes in September, which ended up being the first feature in the series. We talked about things fueling his art, you know, the past, his childhood in Louisiana, and the present, the, the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, uh, the protests against police violence that have taken place here and all over the country, and of course the pandemic. After talking to him, it became clear to me that I wanted to have this conversation with other Black artists in Dallas to get a sense of where they were at in this moment. And the result is, I hope, a look at the diversity of creative expression among some of the city's brightest creative talents. You know, as a journalist, it's always very rewarding when people open uh, are very open with you and they share their ideas, their joys, and their fears. So I do want to take a second to thank all of our panelists tonight for their time and for trusting me with their stories. I encourage you to listen to the radio features if you haven't already. And remember that we're gonna end tonight's conversation with a Q&A, so make sure to submit your questions in the chat below. I have the pleasure of introducing our guest this evening, so without further ado, let's get into that. Our first panelist tonight is Sierra L. Bryant. Sierra is a multidisciplinary artist specializing in photography, video, installations, and mixed media. Her work focuses on black identity and culture, exploring how they exist in the new millennium. She recently curated an exhibition featuring nearly a dozen North Texas artists at the gallery. She's also an educator teaching and facilitating artist workshops for children and adults. Sierra has a master of fine arts from Southern Methodist University. We also have David Jeremiah joining us tonight. David is a self-taught mixed media artist. He's earned a reputation for his inverted performance installations, which ask his audiences to grapple with issues like racism, and police violence head on. He's a recipient of the 2020 Nasher Artist Grant. And David is also preparing for his very first show outside of Texas. His exhibition at the Von Ammon Co. Gallery in Washington, DC is scheduled to open May of 2021. But if you ask David, he'll simply say he's the blank blank Texas version Ferruccio Lamborghini. And our third panelist tonight, Desiree Venicia. Desiree is best known for her portraiture and her experimentation of the female persona. Her images often have facial expressions and anatomical details reduced and neutral, emphasizing the female and her gestures. She has a solo show coming up at Conduit Gallery in Dallas. The show called Been On My Way opens December 5th. And Desiree was awarded the Arch and Ann Giles Kimbrough Fund this year and the City of Dallas Arts Activate Grant in 2019. She also teaches art at J.L. Long Middle School here in Dallas. And Desiree received her BFA in graphic design from McMurray University. And finally, our moderator this evening is Vivian Crockett. She's the Nancy and Tim Hanley Assistant Curator of Contemporary Art at the Dallas Museum of Art. She specializes in art of the African and Afro-Latinx diasporas and the Americas with a focus on the intersections of race, gender, and queer theory. Her first acquisitions for the DMA are currently on view as part of an exhibition titled To Be Determined. They include paintings by Dallas's own O'Shea Green and Jamie Holmes. Vivian is also a PhD candidate in art history at Columbia University. She's writing her dissertation on art practices in Brazil in the 60s and the 70s. Vivian, I wanna thank you so much for joining us and for guiding our conversation this evening. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay. Well, how's everyone doing? I just wanted to do a quick temperature check, keep it really real to see how everyone's feeling tonight. You know, we here, we're doing it. Cheers. <laughs> all right, all right, <laughs> everyone's doing okay? Yes, yes. smiles yeah. out here, okay, cool. I wanted to start talking actually about Vibrant Thing because I think that was such an incredible show for me to witness, to see the kind of diversity of approaches that were made space for. I think, um, Sierra, I read that you were talking about creating a space where artists could show work without an agenda, without an explicit kind of um, call to 
to address the kind of trauma porn, <laughs> if I may use the term, that people I think are also hoping to get out of these engagements with black art. So really centering black joy, black anger, a lot of kind of different registers. And I thought it might be a good entry point to talk a little bit about the pieces that you all had in the show. Um, Sierra, your piece server, Foga, which I think is amazing. Um, and Desiree, your self-portrait and yeah, just let's start there. <laughs> um, I think uh, the show in itself, um, thank you guys for participating in it again for the 150th time. Y'all made it what it was supposed to be. But um, I think uh, I did want to focus on how um, we can exist in the world and we are not a monolith and we can be whatever we want to be and we can grieve we can experience joy, we can experience happiness, and we can make art out of that. And it doesn't have to be like, what is the worst thing ever that happened to me? And let me show it in art just to get a response. It was like, no, what is the best thing that has happened to me? And what has it taught me to be an artist? And what does that look like? Um, to have David and Desiree in the show was very important to me because yes, totally different spectrums, and totally different mediums of work, but it still was one was coming out of a place, a place of, you know, ancestral um, ties and what that meant to show a lineage. And the other one was dealing with what is anger after being incarcerated. Um, and both of those elements needed to exist in that room because we all have experienced one or the other, or we have had people experience in our lives, one or the other. Um, but I would let them talk about their work. My work wasn't that, you know, fantastic in the show, but um, Desiree, jump in. I mean, David, jump in. Um, I guess for me, for my piece, um, the huge thing that I wanted to touch on was kind of like, I, I find myself always wanting to pay homage to my family. And um, I just, when, Sierra told me about this show. I was trying to find like the most positive thing that I've ever done, like I've ever put out there. So for me, I write everything down. I love writing. Um, so I was going through my journal entries from when I was in college. And it just, this um, paragraph that I wrote about going back home and not being ashamed to go back home kind of stand, stood out to me because I had just graduated from college. Um, I said this before, but I I had a whole husband. I got married my senior year. And I was just excited to go back home and to be with my little cousins and to be around my family, but then also to give them the knowledge that I've learned to maneuver through college and being away from our, our very big family. So that way they were able to be successful whenever they left. So kind of just giving them their flowers and letting them and giving them that wisdom and that knowledge. So for me, I felt like that was like it was the happiest part for me to go back home. So I really wanted to put that in that piece. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, like, Fogo with me was, was uh, more about like exploring like self therapy, you know what I'm saying? Um, finding like, well, obviously more like positive ways to channel these emotions that you're shunned for even thinking about, it feels like. But um, I mean, that was about it. But I think, I think straight to the point. Yeah, but I also I love that that piece is like it is about like finding that healing, finding that center, but also like that healing doesn't mean you let go of the anger. It doesn't mean you let go of right. the other feelings, like those things right. there. And I think, you know, some people think it's like this they want the trajectory of like, oh, we've experienced trauma, we've experienced hardship, and now everything's all good. Look at this work, like, it's great. And it's more, <laughs> more complex than that. I think, you know, it's important to show that range. I'm not, I'm not gonna let you off the hook, Sarah, because I think you're trying to not talk about your work, but I really, really love that piece. I think also because it does have this well, more, I'm please talk, talk. yeah, y'all talk to each other too. I don't need to over, Somebody, I mean, I guess somebody asked me, asked me a more specific question, and then I'll elaborate on that, but kind of like to piggyback on what you just said, uh, you know, even anger doesn't have to be, like, angry. 
you know, that's in my mind where the therapy comes in. I mean, sometimes like there's different degrees uh, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a case by case basis. Like uh, art is my therapy, making something with my hands, like, you know, expressing it, that that's enough for me. Like some people, they just need to get it off their chest and like they go sit in the car and they scream and that's all they need. Mike Xavier obviously needed a lot more than like both of those two previous examples. So, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm in my lane and, you know, I'm trying to define my emotions for myself. You know, I'm not going to let nobody sit up here and make me feel like I'm this or I'm that just because like I'm being honest about being human. You know, humans, you know, we ain't all, we ain't what we all act like we cut out to be, man. Like, you know, there's a lot going on. So I was just honest with it. I mean, you know. I think, um, I will, I'm going to talk about David's piece and why I chose that. And he was the only person that I specifically asked for something from, um, because I knew that that piece literally could build a range of emotions for the viewer, but also as somebody that <clears throat> could be potentially in the same situation, like how would I deal with my anger? How would I deal with my decision to go off? Um, and it was really helpful because it's like, what is therapy? What is fixing um, an emotional barrier? What is overcoming something that was traumatic? What is overcoming something that was hurtful to me and the people around me? Uh, and I think, you know, it is confrontational to see that shit. Like, being in the gallery and uh, it's completely quiet and all you hear is bang, 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 while you're enjoying all these other pieces, you stop and think and you're like, what is wrong? What do I need? What do I, what, 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 why is this a thing that I'm drawn to? Uh, but when, we, when, when I chose that piece, I literally texted him in the middle of the day and I was like, hey, I know you probably wanna give me something else, but I want Boga because with all the artists that's in the show, I think Foga is needed, blah, blah, blah. Just give me Foga. Uh, and that's how that happened. But I really wanted people to sit with that piece in a quiet ass space and have to deal with it. Um, I guess my work, Armor, um, talks about um, everything that I have to put on and get ready to venture out into the day, whether it is a you know, having my hoop earrings on like I do right now, as well as my braids down to my butt, you know, those are the things that make me feel better about being a Black woman in society today. Um, it's also referencing the things that I have to consume to be comfortable with myself every day. Um, it's kind of fucked up, but it is what it is. Um, but I try to literally armor myself every time I get up in the morning, you know, I do my mantras and say my affirmations, bust the nut and keep it moving. Cause it's just like, I have to get ready to go through the day and I have to prepare myself with these things. Uh, and they make me be this person. And I'm glad to share that with people. I'm glad to show that my braids are a part of the things that I'm armored with. My hoops are a part of the things I'm armored with. The prayers that I say to Breonna Taylor are the things that I'm armored with. The prayers I say to my ancestors who have got me to this point are the things that I'm armored with. And I'm glad that I can put that in an artwork and say that these are the things that I am and that make me a black woman to face everyday traumas. That's right. Why are you looking at me like that, girl? I don't know. It's not so emotional. <laughs> I'm sorry, babe. <laughs> I mean, it's just like people don't understand that that's like, that's a daily ritual. You have to just like, you know, we have different ways of it, but at the end of the day, we're doing the same thing. When we wake up in the morning, we say things to ourselves and we repeat words that our family members or our mothers have taught us and and that, that's just how, how we have to muster it up to keep doing the same repetitive junk and talking to the same repetitive people 
and be better with ourselves at the end of the day, because at the end of the day, it's not technically our fault. Yeah, it isn't our fault. It isn't any, <laughs> none of it's our fault. If uh, Lovecraft uh, country hasn't taught us anything on HBO, um, it isn't our fault. Um, <laughs> shout out to them. Shout out to HBO. Shout out to Misha Green. You know, black creatives are important. <laughs> yeah, like it, it's, it's not our fault. It's not, but we have to prepare for everything we're going through. Like none of this was ch our choice. Half of the things that we endure every day wasn't something we chose at all. Right. And we have to deal with it and it sucks. And yeah, I gotta put on armor to get up and go to the damn grocery store. We're gonna do Uber and deal with, you know, white kids in there. Um, Trump print, print signs, you know, but shout out to them. Saw We're that. here. Saw that. Well, Armour, I think, relates also to, I think, the way that all y'all are navigating this. You've used the term, Sarah, ecosystems, but like the, the weirdness of the art world and its relationship to Black folks and Black cultural production, I think, especially since June. I don't want to spend too much time talking about what other people are doing or not doing, but I know that that's been a lot to navigate for all of us, like me as a curator, y'all as artists. And I think all of you have used different approaches. Like you are in, you are navigating these spaces where you have the gallery shows, you're doing all of that. But Sarah, you made a choice to have that show in an artist-centered space, an artist-run space that comes with its own challenges. And I'm not gonna say that was necessarily easy from the jump, but you are like trying to carve out those spaces in the same way that I think David Jeremiah, you know, your show in the Janet Kennedy Gallery, it is in this kind of, you know, traditional space, but then you have that space open 24 seven without surveillance, like that piece is very, very important. People can go in there and do whatever they want. People have done all kinds of weird things. We can talk about all the things that have happened in that space, but I think that destabilizes the kind of like sanctity and the kind of purity supposedly of like the art exhibition space that we want to push up, I want to push up against so that our, our work isn't existing only in this kind of narrative that doesn't actually challenge the way things are built. And then Desiree, I think you just unveiled an amazing mural, another amazing mural. You That's been a lot of your work um, in recent months as well, making public art. Um, so if y'all can speak to all of those different things I put a lot out there, but that's because I want y'all to flow and talk to hey, you. That's, that's, that's the one on ceiling, right? Is that you on ceiling? Yes. Well, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, she's on ceiling. You know, I'm, I'm low key about to hijack that question because yeah. Ray, I don't. Hmm. So it is very important that you and Sam and Jeremy are a part of that project. And it is also very important that you chose to depict a black woman in that way. Um, it is also very important that you are um, doing that continuously, no matter what project you were given. Um, but you're <laughs> you're low key high. You're doing the thing that David likes to call infiltrating at a like very base neutral level, which is great. But it's like, if you're, you're so consistent that we can't even be mad, like we can't be mad that like, you're literally always constant with, okay, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna show this image, I'm gonna show this image, I'm gonna show this image. Like we can't even be mad about it. And I'm very happy that out of all the things that are happening at Art Walk West this weekend, that you and Sam's mural are next to each other and we are representing for these black women out here that are also making. And it's very important. Yeah. Yeah. Don't cry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't cry. No, let it out. No, let it out. Let it out. Let it all out. No, it's just insane though, because it's just like these past couple of months, I, I had this conversation with another art group. And I said, I just, I've been always doing this work. I've been very constant in what I do. So to get all this, like, oh, would you like to do this? Would you like to do that? 
I'm not changing what I do. I'm not doing anything different because I've always done this. So I don't know anything other than what I've always been doing. Yeah. So to see, um, to see my work on a wall, it's just like, man, this is insane. And it's like, this was just in my sketchbook last week. And it's like, that's the great thing about all these things is like, literally I'm just pulling up things that I've been sketching out, I've been designing. I'm like, one day somebody's gonna ask me to do something like this and I'm gonna already have it done. So I feel like that's how I'm able to be consistent and I'm able to just throw things out there because I'm like, oh, you want something? Here, I got you. So. Yeah, it's really, it's really um, especially in that area, it's really important. I mean, it's not that many uh, brown, brown people over there uh, making work, even in the studio spaces and the things that are available to them in Art Walk West, or we're going to say the West Dallas art scene. Um, you know, most of the brown people that, black and brown people that are all, are over there are tagging but they don't have spaces. Um, I think basically of Shay, Jeremy, Jerlisa, David, and um, Vivek are the only people that actually, the only Vivek, man. That actually yeah. have spaces over there that are working um, on visual arts. And, you know, mostly everybody else is like doing music, but then everybody else is over there tagging. So it's like, it's important to have you over there doing the mural, but it's like, ugh, what about everybody else that like literally are working over there? And we're like, me having the show over there was also one of those things of like, am I gonna hijack the space? Am I gonna, you know, bring more opportunity to over here for black, black and brown people? What does that look like to have sweet paths? XLO and 500X over there. Like, what does that even look like to be like, we need brown people having shows. We need black people having shows. And like, I hope that it sparks an interest in some stuff. I hope, you know, more black and brown curators get to shove over there because it's a opportunity to make work. You want to take that, David? Maybe. Yeah, I, mean, I was just going to go back to um, what you said about offerings. I mean, you were basically pointing out how um, there was chaos inside of the installation, right? And all of that was intentional because, you know, like a lot of people advised me to put up security cameras or to not allow it to be accessible 24-7. And obviously I was against that. I mean, the thing is, okay, so I don't know if y'all heard about this or not, but uh, about like a month and a half in, there was collectively like six hundred dollars, right? Um, spread out through each plate. There were six plates. Somebody jacked this shit. In my mind, I mean, I just hope it was somebody who really needed it. But the point I'm trying to make is, you know, let's just say it was, let's just say it was a homeless person, right? Uh, realistically can't give a fuck about like police brutality, realistically can't give a fuck about, uh, you know what I'm saying, George Floyd or, you know, this, that, and the third. They're homeless and they're hungry. David, let me let me ask you real shit, real shit. Like, think about that space. Think about where it is. Can a homeless person actually get into that? Mm -hmm. They get in there all the time. Bro, I would be posted up on the bench, like trying to meet people there for like, you know, walkthroughs and shit like that. And security was constantly harassing. So it's obviously an issue. But I mean, the point I'm trying to make is theoretically or hypothetically, hypothetically, in the ideal, the ideal situation, a homeless person took. So now we have. That's the best case scenario, I guess, I'm going to say. Okay. Think about it. Ideal, I, ideally. Ideal. All I'm trying to do is make a point. So check me out. So <laughs> let's say it was a homeless person, okay? Now you have this issue that's uh, definitely just as important as police brutality and yada yada whoop whoop, or arguably more so, but it's vying for the attention that it needs to be resolved, but it can't get because we still stuck on this dumb shit that the law is doing and the powers that be is doing. So that's why I wanted it to be, uh, excuse me, chaotic. Uh, you know, 
if you want to come in there and take money from one collection plate and put it in another one, that's on you. If you was in there and somebody came in, it's on you to tell them. They like, you know, hey, can you give me a second? I'm trying to have a moment. Or like there was just like a world of pockets. I wanted it to be like real life. Because see, I actually just got through tallying up like everybody's like, you know, the work or they grief and shit like that. And you know, some you know, it's, it's pretty it's pretty sad. So let's say if I go up to a cops, uh one of the cops families and be like, hey, you know, I'm David Jeremiah. Woo -woo -woo. I created this installation, and this is what us as a community uh, deem your grief and loss to be worth. And it's just a dollar and eighty three cents. I mean, it's not about being insensitive. That's just real life, nigga. Life ain't got no feelings. You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, you are right. I definitely wanted it to be chaotic. Uh, you know, do whatever you want to do in there. My homie told me he brought his girlfriend up there on some like freaky deaky shit. I'm like, bro, you know, do you? Do you? Do you? But, uh, yo. I mean, I don't think I would take a date there, but okay. Hmm? I mean, to each time, I don't think I would take a date there. Bro, that, that that atmosphere though, like the chili air, you know what I'm saying? It's cute. But that I think huh? was so cute. I got out of it. But I think it's also you're creating a, a space, right? A public space in theory where people can go. Like there's a need. Like, yeah, people want to see art. They also want to get it on. They also want a place to smoke where they're not gonna be harassed by cops. Like there's all these other things that you're creating a space for by having that there. Another but thing I want to do is just like put you in a position to put your money where your mouth is. I mean, money is like the universal uh, rectifier. You know what I'm saying? If you get locked up 20 years, they find out however DNA or whatever the fuck that like you were like innocent this whole time. You know what they they can't give you your time back. What they give you is money. If you die in a free, you know, like an accident, like a plane crash, you, you sue them, you get money. So like money is this very like acceptable um, uh, arm, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's just like this very acceptable apology. And I just wanted to put people in the situation to where, hey, you got five dead cops. You got the nigga who killed them. Whose grief and loss is worth the most? It's just very simple. Like, um, I don't know, man. I feel like the cops had go their GoFundMe's. Like those, those cops probably got their, they got theirs elsewhere. But right. uh, I mean, very, you know, Micah got the same love. So right. you talk about GoFundMe's. We know how uh, right. popular they, they, his family. They have to like basically grieve in fucking privacy in secret. Because it's just not allowed. And see, that's the thing, you know, like, oh, so like as, as black people, like, first of all, y'all have heard me say this a thousand times here. I know you have. You know, first of all, we have to actually provide like uh, the context of the conversation, which is our bodies, our broken black bodies. Then on top of that, we have to initiate the conversation. And then on top of that, we have to present it in a way that doesn't offend the motherfuckers who we got the issue with who are wrong. So a big part of offerings, I just wanted to set up a situation where I could be direct. Nigga, making art is already a like indirect way of like communicating something. And that's fine. I mean, like, you know, it is what it, I mean, there's real consequences for doing things a certain way. Mike Xavier did what he did, and he's at where he's at. You know what I'm saying? RIP. But I'm just saying, bro, like. I call them like inverted performance installations because what I really attempt to do is have as much of the conversation already laid out for you. And the only thing left is essentially like your dialogue. And you're the performer. The person who comes to consume the art yeah. is actually the one who has to perform. Yeah. But you also right. did yeah. the lookout. Yeah. I'm, okay. I, I would rather you sit up here and like, you know, soft shoe for me instead of me doing it for you. Like my ancestors already did enough of it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, okay, let's go there then. 
<laughs> I wish we had a long, long time to talk, but I want to talk a no. little bit about kind of the challenges of this year. I think that's kind of, you know, that is part of the framework of this conversation, the state, the state of things. Um, <laughs> and just, yeah, kind of wanting to hear from y'all, like how you've been navigating that, like the real life of the pandemic, of people being thirsty for, <laughs> for your art. <laughs> like all the different ways that you're trying to move through all of this and uh, the ways that you, the this kind of support you want, kind of let's call it in, let's name the things you want right now and what what you feel is. <laughs> uh, I, wanna, I wanna piggyback off a conversation we had during our panel talk for a vibrant thing that was moderated by um, John Spurgins who runs South Dallas Cultural Center. Um, one of the biggest things we always said we needed was money and space. If you give me money and you give me space, I can make it work. Point blank, period. I don't know why is that so hard for um, people to receive. But those are the two things that I know I need, they need, any artist behind me needs, any artist that I support needs is money and space. Finding equitable pricing for studios are ridiculous. Let me rephrase, private studios is ridiculous. Um, something with a door and preferably a bathroom is, you know, you're upwards of like 500, $600. And one, we already make less than any white man, any white woman, so right there. We're out of the game. But also the money to fund our work. We are literally scraping by. Like I said earlier, I'm driving Uber Eats to, you know, pay for my car note and a studio. Well, not this studio space, another space. But like it's it's wild. Like the fact that I have to do this to survive is wild. But that is the two things that we need. But then we also need guidance when it comes to legal rights, as well as things that are looking like, how do I write a grant? Because guess what I didn't learn in my BFA or my MFA? How do I write a grant? How do I write a proposal? Word. I didn't learn that in school. I had to go get a book, dig it up, figure it out. Now, be if I decided to be represented, that's also 10 to 45% that is taken away from me for somebody to tell me the same thing. Oh, hello. You were frozen for a second. Can you can you back up and just say this last little bit? You said the last couple of sentences probably. But, uh, uh, the, 10, the 10 to 40% to... After the grant thing, you said, you know, yeah. having learning the tools of grant writing and all that. Oh, and then, okay, so um, people want to have equitable fellowships and grants and give all these things away. But the two things that I have figured out is you either have to know somebody that is in a position of power to give you some money, or you have to know how to write your ass off. Mm. Those are the two things that I've learned. If you can't write or you don't know how to write a grant, you're not going to get any money. If you don't have somebody that can back you up to write a grant, you're not going to get any money. If you have all these other things ahead of you and you have the work and everything, but you make one typo or you didn't explain your thought process correctly, you're not going to get that grant. And nobody taught us that. I didn't learn that. I went to UTD. That's a nice ass school, right? Didn't learn how to write a grant there in undergrad. I went to SMU, another nice ass expensive school. Did not also learn how to write a grant there. Even though they have a professional practice class that's only offered to undergrads, it is not offered to MFA program um, graduates. Um, and that is a lack because we're the people that are supposed to be, you know, making our practice as a professional business and a career. We didn't learn any of that. I had to get a book, I had to scour the internet, I had to copy and paste and be like, this is, does this apply to me? No, it doesn't. Do I need to call somebody? To re, re look at this, yeah, like it's wild um, that we don't get that information, but also the fact that we don't know um, that open calls are happening. Um, when I was at UCD, I did not know about ArtCon until after I graduated, and ArtCon is a Cedars Union 
um, event that happens that used to happen every year, twice a year, depending on what they ask you to participate in. Um, I didn't know that until after I graduated. I didn't know about certain open calls that was available to me in um, in community college because they weren't reaching out to certain professors. Like there is all these inequities that are happening that we're not talking about, but literally time and space that offers opportunities to tell me that, hey, this is going on. Hey, this is what you need to do. Money, AKA more than $500, because we need it every year, we need it every week, we need it every month. We need the money and space. If you got a space available, if you own a warehouse, give it to an artist. You're gonna make your money back, because guess what? They need a space to work. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's all you have to give us. Very. And let me let me let me jump on let me jump on to the uh to like the need the need train man like look uh shout out to all the collectors who just ain't like sitting up here copping like basically broken like victim stance ass black bodies hanging on the white wall man mm -hmm. like I had one collector who like made it extremely clear that she wasn't like all of the other collectors like. You know, she collects black artists, and then she had the nerve to sit up here and ask me, "Well, how do I, as a collector of black art, collect the David Jeremiah?" Hopefully, you pay for it. <laughs> Hopefully, you pay for it. Hopefully, you don't buy it at auction. You buy and it. Then she was like, well, "Okay," so she was speaking about my Calder piece specifically, uh, the hanging baby mobile, right? She was like, "Well, what if my mailman walks up my front yard to deliver my mail, and he sees your Calder?" just hanging in my window. What do I do then? You explain it. Mm -hmm. You actually buy art that you believe about instead of trying to just sit up here and flip a nigga, bro. Like, that's my thing. Like, you know, you see, when you're trying to like start your shit off and you're climbing the ladder, let's take the race shit out of it. The game is the game, bro. You know, unless you're born into it, Somebody has what you'll eventually want, and they'll want you to do this, not say this, say this, or not do that to get it. You know what I'm saying? That's just the game. You know, you take your lick like everybody else. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But my thing is, bro, like, you know, like my piece has got like my soul in it, bro. You can feel it when you see in person, bro. And like, not to say that y'all don't, but like, you know, like, it's really my therapy, bro. Like my art is really like the only thing that's keeping me sane. That and my son. You know what I'm saying? I'm a fucker. Like this is like my third time, like getting to a point to where like I'm really productive, and you know I'm getting attention for it, and it's almost viable. And usually I fuck up and start, you know, hanging back with the homies, and I end up in jail or I lose it. You know what I'm saying? So, but at the same time, like. You know, ego is not like the devil. You know what I'm saying? Like, they try to get you to believe it is, but like, you know, I got pride. Uh, and I don't want to give it up for nobody. And there's certain collectors that like, I've had to sit up here and play the game with just because they're in situations of power because they have money that disgusts me. You know what I'm saying? So, I, you know, what I would prefer, what I need is for y'all to respect something. And, you know, like, just be real about it. Like, you know, if you can afford art, you can, you'll weather somebody ridiculing you about just speculating black art. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You know, you still got the pieces. They'll still be worth some them. But, you know, you got, like, a lot of artists, bro, who, like, they're at the point of, like, bleeding out for their art, and it's great. And they have to wait for, like, they have to just wait for something like just to happen on some fluke shit to make it to the next level. Bro, there's so many artists, bro, who sit up here and just like bleed out, give up, this, that, and the third because of these collectors who are just in the way, sitting up here doing it for you. And most of y'all in the way. And like, whatever. But come on, man, don't play with me like that, bro. You know, there's certain collectors that I, I damn sure I want to have my pieces. But in this moment right now, just to keep it a buck, they can have it because I need it. You know what I'm saying? Well, I would love shit. to hear what Desiree has to say because I think my follow-up question would be like, what are we ready to give up? Like, 
some things like I'm down while it's still here, but you know, what are we willing to kind of do a different way? Cause it's like, say the word, you know, say the word, but does it really Anything oh, I was with Sierra, I would say we just need money and space. And you know, the funny thing is about like writing grants. I have to write grants as an educator. If I want money for my class, you got I'm writing grants. So yeah. I already taught how to write grants because my mom is a kindergarten teacher, and she worked for nonprofit organizations like Head Start and uh, Child Care Group. So I already knew how to write grants from a different career path. And it just so happened to like yeah, me too. My mom is also an educator and fucking been teaching before I was born. And that's the only reason I learned how to write a grant. And it's a whole different process, but we have to adapt it, mm -hmm. make it, you know, something that is feasible for us to use. Um, right. I think Vivian was about to ask you about sacrifice in your work. Um and uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a story real quick, and I'm gonna I'm gonna alley you with you guys already because so the first piece that sold at Vibrant Thing mm -hmm. was this is ceramic um piece that was um very 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 fond of. No matter who saw it, they always wanted it, but it was already sold. And Desiree was the second to last piece to be sold um, off. Um, and I'm gonna make this 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 whole thing come full circle. The first piece was that was to be sold was to a white person. Shout out to them. They collected a very beautiful piece. But the last piece, the second to last piece to be sold was to a black man. And the fact that I knew where it was going. I was very torn um, about Jerlisa's piece, but I was also very ecstatic about who I know, who I knew who was gonna get Desiree's piece. And it's just like, sometimes we sacrifice those moments. Like, like I make this art and I have to fucking give it up to a person that doesn't know what this piece actually means to me. What this piece actually is to me. And uh, Byron Sanders getting Desiree's piece is, you know, mind boggling because I know he deserves it. I also know his, his kids are going to cherish it. I know his wife is going to cherish it in a very different way than, you know, a white collector will ever will. And it is important in this, like, this moment of sacrifice. And Desiree, I know you sacrifice a lot because you got prints, you got t-shirts, you got murals, you got actual fucking paintings that are going out every day. And it's just like, girl, are you okay? Are you okay with this? No. Like in, in the beginning, I was not. And now I'm just at the point of I have to be... Um, hopeful if that makes sense like I have to be hopeful that you know the point that I had in this piece gets across and then on top of that it's like I try to explain to people but like literally my paintings are my inner utmost thoughts like these are my words just visualize that's it and so it was hard in the beginning because I was just like I don't know who you are like only my friends buy my work which I'm cool with but it's like, I'm never to be selling to people who are in New York or <laughs> I don't know what to do with this. So <laughs> um, um, I, I think it's a weird, like at the temple sacrifice to be like, I want to make all this art and it's for these people. And I know it's for these people, but the people that can buy it and collect it and resell it mm -hmm. and stuff are gonna be white people in power and you have to relinquish that at some point. See, this is why I'm so big on like infiltration, but like also like, um, you know, like just keeping it real. Like, you know, there's so many people who like climb up the ladder and then they just get seduced, bro. You know, like just the success and yada, yada, whoop, whoop. 
Um, you, you just gotta promise yourself that once you make it, I mean, you ain't gotta sit up here and like change the world. I mean, like that's the politician's job. Like we're artists. Like I'm not supposed to sit up here like and uh, create a uh, a foundation and stuff like that. More power to you if you do it. But like we have people who aren't doing their job that's supposed to do that. But one thing that you should do, in my opinion, once you do break through and infiltrate, is hold the door open for the next person. Or just talk real shit about all the fucking like bullshit that you had to eat while climbing the fucking ladder. So go ahead. I'm gonna hold you to the holding the door open because and I'm Vivian, I'm hijacking your conversation. I'm so sorry. This is what it's about. I am here to just you know take this place <laughs> to go but this where you so you're gonna, you gonna hold me to holding the door I'm going to do that because you know what that is what vibrant thing was was holding the door open on many levels and i hold the door i held the door open for uh a whole month i and if we want to piggyback on the natural shit i made sure that everybody that i was friends with that was an artist was in that my natural piece without even knowing they were gonna be in my in my natural piece but you already know how, right? already know how right, bro. holding the door open is also very important. That, yeah, means, all about that means saying, Hey, I know I'm doing this, but this person can do it just as good as me, better than me, or you know what? This person needs an opportunity more than me. And that is what holding the door open is and building the ecosystem. I know Desiree can paint murals out her butt. And not even think about it and be like, okay, I planned it, it's gonna stress me out. But she might alley you with the Jeremy and be like, yo, Jeremy, you got this? Because I ain't got it this week. You got it? And that's what holding the door open also looks like. It also looks like when we're in a moment of dialogue, saying their name. Because I love Ari. I love you. I love Teresa. I love Xavier. I love all these people that are making the same way as me. I love Jeremy. I love O'Shea. And these people are collected. But it's like we have to literally say our names for each other because that's the only way we are all going to survive in this space. Other than that, it ain't going to be nothing. And that's holding the door open. Holding the door open is also having an interview and being like, yo, I I had a whole round table with these these people, and this is what these people said and naming their names. Because the biggest issue I ever had during Vibrant Thing was not getting everybody's names in print. That was my biggest thing. Everybody's name should have been named. It shouldn't have been See, oh, that was talking about like the city as a platform, man. Like yeah, yeah we can go. Yeah, yeah. But I'm talking about yeah. the best thing that you know Nugent, Nugent Smith and Lauren Woods have ever told me was like, you know, having community is very important because outside of Texas, if you know somebody that's over there and you just happen to come up in a conversation, that is gonna be way more important than whatever happens here. Because Nugent Smith brought my name up to be at the Perez Museum. Mm -hmm. Lauren Woods brought my name up to be doing X, Y, Z in the third. It is about building community and holding the door open. Jatavia, opening up the spaces to be like, I'm going to work with these people that are here and put them other places. I completely okay. agree. I All completely right. agree, bro. Oh, man. I hate to cut it off, but I think we got to open it up to questions. And I want to just make a plug for the vibrant thing, symposium, there's a virtual talk speaking about opening the door and making sure this is a platform to amplify the voices of other people who aren't part of this conversation. I highly recommend checking that out and hearing from some other folks. Um, thank you all for the amazing work y'all are doing and for keeping it real, real. Yeah. We could, I mean, you know, we're just we're gonna, gonna talk about we the could talk a while longer, but. Um, Miguel, do you have any questions for us? And if you don't, we'll just keep talking, but let's see if. Yeah, we actually do. Thank you to uh, to everyone who has um, submitted questions so far. 
uh, here's one for you, for all of you. How do you think your creations tell the story of black people in Dallas specifically? Oh, I have that. Can I get that? Yeah, yeah go for it. <laughs> um, I, I feel like for my piece, it's just like um, kind of the situation of being snuffed out and everything working against you, but you're still being able to rise from like basically the sidewalk. Like my family has been here in East Texas for multiple generations and we're thriving. And it's you, every statistic that you can possibly think of. You know, I, my mom had me when she was 17. My dad was in and out of prison. I grew up in Pleasant Grove and uh, North Dallas, Blood Chapel, like all these things that are, you know, too negative. It's like supposed to put me down, but it doesn't. And so I think that definitely shows in all of my pieces as far as like living in Dallas and growing up in Dallas. As far as I go, I mean, like, um, I've I've grown to be like extremely selfish with like my purest energy, which I classify as my creative energy. So like, uh, you know, all of my art is like from like the recesses of like my mind and my soul and like my heart and shit like that. You know, I love the city just on some like being on that type shit. But like, I can't sit up here and like be like any of my bodies of work are about like Dallas past like how I immediately connect to it as like a black man you know a lot of my work a lot of my a couple of my bodies of work definitely focus on Mike Xavier and that specific uh conversation that he had with the laws of July 7th going on like four and a half years ago but you know I when you when you hear me talk about like I do it for the city and it's really really important for me to like for all of like my career milestones to pop off in Dallas first like my first solo show yada yada whoop whoop it's just because like that percentage of my mind is still on like that hood shit like I you give a fuck about Dallas but you know I just came back from Washington D.C. and Boston and I would move there today if I could oh Baltimore I keep saying Boston bro. I'm in Baltimore, but like I would move there today if somebody would do. Uh, so, uh, that's I my. Think, I mean, I think I feel like we all rep the city a very specific way. I mean, I'm I'm a implant, you know, I'm from Miami, so three oh five till I die. Uh, but three one four nine seven two, bitch, <laughs> your girl. I mean, uh, I've lived in Oak Cliff for eleven years. And uh, before that, I lived in Carrollton. We're not going to talk about that. Shout out to Dion, a.k.a. my mom, that put me in the safest place ever in Texas. And then it turned out not to be. Um, but I rep for Oak Cliff really, really, really hard because I'm a part of the community. I make community decisions. We um, are a part of, we live in a historic district, so we're advocating for preserving, you know, our neighborhood in very specific ways. Um, and I rep for Oak Cliff harder than I thought I was going <laughs> to rep. But, you know, um, Miss Oak Cliff, shout out to you. If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. But um, shout out to Big T as well. <laughs> but I rep for the city. I, I, I'm an implant and I was taken in and I was nurtured and my first solo show was at the South Dallas Culture Center. So I can't not be grateful for this. Sierra, you're, you're kind of answering this next question that I have here. Speaking of holding the door open um, and building community, the question is how do you all feel about black run art spaces and working with those spaces to continually create a black art ecosystem? So I'm gonna I'm steal this real quick. So we are always continuing the conversation. Um, I think my biggest thing right now is to make more spaces that are black run and that have black curators and that have, you know, the community as its main interest. Um, the fact that some of us are working with black um, businesses to make art for them or also work for them is very important in the city. Um, South Dallas Cultural Center being the first and foremost, as well as Oak Cliff that is not technically black, but is very black because of the space and where it is located. Um, they support us more than we ever expected. Pencil and Paper Gallery has um, supported us more than we expected. Masani Gallery in Carrollton, who is also black run, 
uh, has supported, you know, some of the artists that I've had in the show, Jazz and LaShonda, as well as, um, I can't think right now, God, I'm going driving a blank, but they've supported us. Um, and we need to create more spaces. And Daryl being the person that is advocating for us to have more airtime and more print about us and the things we're doing. Yes. Desiree, David? He answered it. I'm good. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, <laughs> It was the question was how do you all feel about black run art spaces and working with those spaces to create a black art ecosystem? I love it. I love the idea. Wish there was more of it. I mean, I've never personally like worked with one. So I mean give me uh give me uh six months, baby. Give me some. Okay. Months. Well, you know I'm there. And, uh, shout out to Mary and uh Adele Marshall. You know, uh I know they're black collectors, but the collectors that I'm talking about are the ones that I specifically define. Like, what are you talking about? That's what I'm talking about. What are you talking about? Okay. I think that, uh, this next question uh, might be a good place to end on. Um, can you guys talk about what you're currently working on? And if you're a part of Art Walk West, if you want to talk about what you're, you're doing this Saturday too. Um, I am currently working on, apparently, apparently, no, just kidding. I am joining um, the Black Voices show for Five Gallery, which the gallery is a part of Art Walk West. I am not. Um, and I'm also working on a couple of, of projects for um, UT Dallas, as well as um, SMU. <laughs> Funny. Um, but I'm working on some stuff for them and future endeavors for myself um, and this collective. So look out for that. But I will be at Art Walk West at Sweet Pass um, taking some photos for um, Black Power Nap. So yeah. come through, come see you know the work. I will also be at Deadbolt Studios and I will also be at 516 Fabrication Studios. Um, I haven't officially, you know, entered into the Art Walk West, but you know, I'll be in the mix. Like my spotlight right there on the corner, 2702 Baton, you know, be in the front yard chilling. Like, I'm sure I'll see a lot of y'all. I'll be waving and stuff. <laughs> but check me out. Uh, as far as like my, my uh, current body of work, uh, it's called, uh, I A H Y F F A W D, uh, externalized slash internalized. Uh, that's the body of work that I'm focusing on for my uh, first out of state solo show, in Washington D.C. My name is Cole. Shout out Todd. Appreciate it, homie. Uh, and I'm also currently uh, fleshing out um, hood niggas camping. Uh, my largest scale work today. And you know, definitely having fun trying to figure out how to squeeze all of those in my studio. And shout out to you, real quick, for finding a way to kind of make space for showing your own work on your own terms. Like, you know, renting really under decks, having people come see your work, getting those pictures taken you know, speaking about your work, I think that, that is so important. I feel very blessed that I got to see that work installed, how you want it shown and not getting a little sneak peek of that, so. I really appreciate it, thank you. Desiree, put it on us, what's going on, boo? So I will be at Art Walk West. Uh, my mural will be on display off Sylvan. Um, it's called uh, Black Beauty is an Act of Resistance and I'm really excited about that. Um, so I'll be there with it. I'll be doing some last minute touch ups. Um, as far as what I have in the works, honestly, I'm done. Like, <laughs> I made all of my major pieces for my solo show back in July. So I'm just like sitting here. Um, but no, I am doing a, um, I'm really excited about this. I'm doing the original drawing cell for a cancer organization called Caleb. Um, and I'm selling all of my drawings that I've been doing for this five month to uh, donate to that organization because they're giving Christmas to two families. So I'm really excited about that. Okay, hold on, I'm my bad. No, go ahead. go ahead, go ahead. I forgot something, go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. 
Well, no. Okay, so I forgot about this project that I'm working on uh, via uh, Jesse Morgan Barton. Shout out to the homie Fort Worth Modern. Uh, he does this collaboration with this like high-end decal maker named Borgia Wolf, and he's invited me to be a part of uh, the of that, which should be dropping um, late November. So I have that coming up as well, as far as like kind of like show is type shit. Right. Desiree, remind us when your your show is at Conduit Gallery. It is December fifth. All right. Well, um, we're running a little over time. It was such a pleasure getting to hear all of you talk about your practice and your work. Thank you, Vivian, for for guiding the conversation. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say so much love and gratitude to all of you, you three, and also to Jamie Holmes and JD Moore, uh, who were part of this series. It, it has really been the highlight of like my my reporting so far this year to get to talk to all of you and get to to share your story with our audiences. Um, you can find those at artandseek.org, and um, we're we're getting ready for our next state of the arts conversation on November twelfth. It's going to be about the mural movement in Fort Worth. Um, murals have become a, a medium and a megaphone for critical conversations and community activism and public art. You can learn more about that conversation and register for it at artandseek.org. Thank you again so much, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Um, and have a good night. Thank you all. Ooh.